we sat in the little snack bar at Sam's Wednesday. And I was looking out at the checkouts at all the people coming and going, all the many varieties of people there. And you really don't know. You really simply don't know about people when you're just looking like that. Mm -hmm. But as I sat there, I wondered how many out there were aware there was a kingdom of light, that there was a spiritual domain where the righteousness prevails, uh, where understanding and insight into the things of God gives man direction and purpose and goodness and, and living and that this light, and that this light was found in Jesus Christ, and He gives it to men. Now, uh, you meet a lot of people that profess to know Christ and they profess to be born again, but you you just don't see any evidence of it. You just don't see any evidence of righteousness and holiness that comes by the way of enlightenment and perception in the God. And, you know, not the kind of things we know that illumination brings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, our topic, of course, is illumination and the redemptive uh, works, our function of it. But I want to point out that now our, the writer in my text, which is the Apostle John, the Apostle John uh, and all the writers of scriptures, of course, they all write from this place of illumination. You, you need to, uh, to say that right now. That, this man, this apostle, he's writing from that realm of illumination. And uh, our text is from the hand of the apostle. He writes as one who has been illuminated, you see, and the scriptures. They were written uh, to those who have been removed from darkness by the illumination of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has shined out of darkness into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ to us. Now, it would be absurd for men in the light, that they should expound or open up to those who, in, who, who are in darkness about the things only found in the light, mm -hmm. you see. That's, yeah. that's why I bring it. Yeah. The, the only exhortation that the light has for those in darkness is this. Awake thou that sleepest, yeah. and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Amen. Now, having been with the light himself, the capital L, light, the apostle John who, uh, who has been given light, He's, uh, he has given us now evaluation of Jesus Christ in, the, in this uh, uh, first of the chapter here. And, uh, and he starts off in, in, uh, in, this, in these scriptures here. He, in him was life, and, and the, this life was the light of men. Now, at the very start of John's account, there at verse 1, uh, the apostle begins at the beginning. In view of eternity, he says, Jesus Christ is eternal. That's what he's saying. In relation to the Godhead, he was the Word, and he was with God. In regard, in regard to the universe and all living things, he made them, and he is the life. And lastly, in his relationship to man, in verse 4, this life is the light of men. So that's why he sets, he sets it up at the very beginning in verse 1. Now, John declares all these facts and realities about Jesus then, in this way. Then we should pay attention to the way the Spirit introduces the testimony of Jesus. From verse 1 and, and, and John, of course, all the way through the end, this letter is going to be a, written to give us profit and to benefit the children of light. Amen. So after reading these first four verses, you need... Uh, you see that a man should be able to, to say that all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. You should be able to say that right there off the first four verses. Amen. The saints uh, should be able to say that, and which this means that Christ, they should reason that Christ is more than sufficient to, sufficient to see about the things I need. Yeah. And that's why it's wrong, brethren, to have this testimony before us and then receive those, or receive them, who come promoting other ideas about salvation. The things that would take our mind off of Christ, and uh, who is the absolute caretaker of this world. Of the things he created, you see. And all the many different ways that you um, uh, can see light, and the, the way that light's understood. All the forms and types and shadows light represents in the scriptures both physically and spiritually, I just would remind you at this time that our Lord, He is the reality of them all. Okay? Amen. For daylight and darkness was created by Him to teach 
these particular truths, the spiritual truths we'll discuss at this, in this weekend. And that is why John would say then, Jesus was both the light and light of men. In the beginning, there was life, life eternal. Mm -hmm. It was this life that existed before anything else was created, you see. It was this life that created all things. It brought everything into existence. One time, there was just life and nothing else. And, and, and this life, this capital L life, it created everything. And it's backward thinking to expect that matter existed first and then somehow life sprang up from it, you see. And here John wants you to know, brethren, that the life wasn't simply some, uh, life, uh, some uh, uh, life-giving force, but it actually was a person. Amen. Not a human person, you see, but a divine living person, eternal person, now, I'm speaking to faithful brethren, and you know this word is just affirming the things you've already believed and, and, and hold dear. But having said these things, though, all this I've said, this is not the main point that our wonderful apostle is making here. Because in a previous verse, before my text, John's already stated all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So I think the apostle Paul has moved from that declaration earlier and verse 4 to something, some greater truth. It's God's intention to open up with Jesus as not only as the creator of everything, but the reality of Jesus as the life and light of men. And the fact that John has put the two together, life and light, and, 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 and furthermore that he sees life and light in relation to men, tells why that Jesus is so indispensable to men. That say he's put life and life Life and light together with men shows that Jesus is very indispensable. It cues us that John is not meaning this physical life at all, is he? That he has something entirely different in mind. The life that John is talking about, of course, in verse 4, is uh, the eternal life, the spiritual life. The life he speaks of is uh, what in verse 4 will tell us more about it, you see. It's, it's going to tell us what kind of life Jesus brings. It's going to tell us the quality and the characteristics of this life. Jesus calls it the light of life. Yeah. Look at verse 5, and you'll see that this verse goes with verse 4. It tells more about this life and how that the light of it shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So at this time, we just need to say that without Jesus, there's no light. Okay? We can say from John's testimony, there was, there's no light physically and there's no light spiritually. Amen. John says true light, true light. Without Jesus, there's only darkness. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's exactly the condition of when Jesus came into the world. There was no light. Now, John uses the two words, life and light, because these are the issues, aren't they? Yeah. Life. Because men are in dark, light because men are in darkness, yeah. and life because men are dead. Yeah. Okay, so those are the issues mm -hmm. regarding men. God is not all satisfied with this, though, that men were dead to Him, and concerning the things of God that men were in darkness, He wasn't satisfied with this. So the good news is that God is going to do something about this, correct this, mm -hmm. and this is the announcement of Apostle John that the Creator Himself has come into this world of darkness. The people which sat in darkness saw. Great light. Mm -hmm. And to them which sat in the region in shadows of death, light has sprung up. Mm -hmm. Jesus came so men could see God. Jesus came so men could know God. And this is the sole purpose, you see, of men mm -hmm. to know God and from this knowing to have eternal life. So when, when we read Acts 17, we understand where Paul, what Paul is trying to say here. You remember this encounter. This is uh, when the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, they encountered Paul, or Paul encountered them uh, in, in Athens, and they give him an opportunity to speak concerning Jesus and the resurrection. So in verse 26 and 27, after Paul had declared God to be the creator and Lord of heaven, he sets before them the reason, the purpose for which God created men Amen. and had and had made one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might 
feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from every one of us. Every one of us means each and every one of us. The exposition of the purpose of God for men is one of the many times we have from Paul that confirms man's sole objective. See, Paul is many, many times Paul uh, opens this up to us that God's uh, man's sole objective is to seek and find God. And men will be held accountable for not doing this, Amen. not seeking after him, as you see. Uh, and this is uh, in view of the fact that God, and we want, to, we want to understand that, that God has already provided everything necessary for this to happen, and men still not seek. Uh, for this is what is meant by the, this little editorial remark, though he be not very far from every one of us. And the Holy Spirit slips this in there. For those who might feel after him, as it says here, they will find him, you see. God has seen to that. For he's placed himself so that he can be found. Yeah. And men who did not desire God, who did not care to happily feel after him, to find him, well, they will stand one day. They'll stand before God wanting. They'll stand before the same God. The scripture says, he be not far from every one of us. Mm -hmm. Well, we see the willingness of God to make himself known. Mm -hmm. He has put all men in their proper place as it relates to him, according to his purpose. That men desire and search after God. It shows the reality and about the true situation. Verse 27 says, Happily, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from every one of us. He's right there. God is right here. Feel for him. And find him. This is what this wonderful Amen. universe has, was created to say, you see. And yet it's quite impossible for men to find God. We're like the blind men groping after to find the entrance to some room. While we're certain the room has a, an entrance way or, or doorway, we must feel along the wall until we discover it. The point, though, it, it's enough. Enough has been given to cause men to desire God and to feel after him and to search for him. So the condemnation will be in not seeking and searching. We must say it, it uh, is quite impossible to come to know God, even by searching, if he does not make himself to be known. This is all related to light and the illumination, see, that God's going to provide the blind man groping for the doorway. Now, finding the opening would be likely if, uh, if perhaps the blind man were in a small room, a closet room. He, he could find the doorway pretty. What if he was in a large, very large room or complicated room? Perhaps it wasn't a room at all. Maybe it was a, a wall, a long, big wall. You see how uh, very impossible it would be. Uh, it was for this kind of reason that disciples asked Jesus, who then can be saved? It was the same kind of circumstance when they asked that question. And, of course, Jesus said, uh, for men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. So God's gonna, he's going to make it possible. God is not left to seeking and searching without hope. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Promise. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened, God says. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to show that how, how the life Jesus brings is new life. And that this new life is about light. About the illumination, see, that God's going to provide for those who are seeking and searching and groping after him. And the light works to reveal and make God known. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night came to him for counsel in John 3. And Jesus, perceiving that Nicodemus was not able to understand the things of God in the kingdom, he told Nicodemus right off the bat, remember, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He just yes. told him flat out, you cannot see it, mm -hmm. you can't receive it, and for that reason, you cannot enter in. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus needed to be enlightened. Jesus right. knew that. And he needed the light of God to shine in his heart, yeah. to illuminate. Give him understanding. I like what Nicodemus did. Don't you? Yes. I'm so glad he knew where to go. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, and he knew who to ask. Yes. 
I'm so glad we have this record. You can rest assured that after Nicodemus asked this question, he never asked this kind of question again, not after he was enlightened. The light of spiritual life confirms new life, okay? The illuminating quality of it, it confirms it. John 9, 39, 41, we've made a reference to it already. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world, and they, that they which not, may not see, that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and they said unto him, are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Now, this text is taken from the, that wonderful account of the born man, the man born blind. Wonderful. Uh, it's a marvelous illustration, isn't it, of true blindness. Mm -hmm. That a man who can't see God is truly blind. They're the blind ones. Mm -hmm. The irony, irony in this account is that the sighted, those who were sighted, they were really blind. And the blind was really with sight. It was a blind man who had the sight to see, for he could see God. That, that was the most important thing. And those who had sight, physical sight, were, they were really blind because they couldn't see God. These Pharisees here. Now, do you suppose they were some of the same crowd that Jesus come across in Matthew 15, 12? Could have been. This group confronted Jesus, and they basically asked him why he didn't honor the tradition of the elders, because his disciples didn't follow the ceremonial washing of their hands before they ate. Later on, Jesus answered them. Later on, after the Pharisees had left, the disciples came to Jesus and told him, Do you know you offended the Pharisees with your answer to them? Jesus replies, rather shocking. Jesus, listen to what Jesus uh, makes known about these men. They didn't know about these men. Jesus did. Uh, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they both shall fall into the ditch. <clears throat> why wouldn't the religious leaders come to Christ? Even while having so much overwhelming, credible evidence, why wouldn't they come? Well, they simply couldn't see. They had given themselves to a religious system, okay, that men had built. And it had all the appearance of a godly, strict religious form. They've given it, themselves to it. It had provided all the religious things that were important to them. It allowed for a, a distinction among men. And they really did not love God. They loved the system, you see, and the praise of men. They just, because for that reason, they couldn't see God. Amen. Jesus said, leave them alone. They've been, they've been given as leaders of the blind. That's what he said. And they both shall fall in a ditch. They were not the plannings of God from heaven's point of view. And today, we have a religious conglomerate fashioned after the teachings of men. It's a divided thing, you see. It's divided because it represents the teachings of many different men. These are groups are divided each. Each one to its own self-sufficiency. They're in a little group separated from one another. They're self-reliant, even in their groups. They don't have no need from any of the other groups. They don't have no need of anything. They put all their trust in men. And they have really left no place for God at all. It's a, it's a compromise of the modern church I'm speaking of. And it sounds like the one in Revelation 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and knowest that not that thou art wretched, and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel thee mm -hmm. to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that may, mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. We begin our walk in Christ, okay, by the illumination of the Spirit and the enlightenment of the truth that God gives us. He working through the Spirit. And the brethren, we continue this way, walking in the very same way in which we've begun. By walking and abiding in the light. And the way it's been shown to us and illuminated for us. It says if we walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. And this is the way it is. Amen. 
It can be no other way, for God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So this is the way it is. It was this very subject that the Apostle Paul was addressing to the Corinthians in the second chapter. He was trying to explain to them some things, and this is the way he explained it. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for there are foolishness unto him. Neither can it be known them, because they are spiritually discerned. These things are spiritually discerned. For this reason, the saints can say, Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Amen. Now this is the illumination that comes by the way of the Spirit of God. This is the illumination of which we speak about this weekend. You know, what a tragic circumstance had taken place there in Re Revelation 3 at the church of Laodicea. They had carelessly removed, carelessly removed themselves mm -hmm. from the light. And, you know, darkness had then come right on in, didn't it? Uh, they couldn't see their need for God anymore. If that was, they just couldn't see it. The brethren began their way in the kingdom, like all saints do, by putting, their, by putting on Christ and walking in the Spirit. That's the way they started. Uh, their eyes have been opened to the glories of the kingdom to come. They, they see the wonders of the redemption that was in Christ Jesus. They saw all these things. But now the evaluation from Jesus himself is they must repent, that they were wretched and miserable what they were, poor, blind, and naked. That's what Jesus said about them. In every circumstance he could name, they were in need. Spiritually, they were broke, and they didn't have any spiritual life at all. They were poor and poor, blind and naked. It is possible, you see, for this, what happened there in this congregation could happen to any place, could happen to any person, where the influence of the world is allowed to come in yeah. and to dominate your thinking. So we press the saints, don't we, to enter in, to make their calling election sure. And, and so with so many words like this, we confirm one another. In spiritual life, isn't it wonderful? There's been no restrictions placed on us. There's no, li there's no, no limits. The light has come to give us full illumination of the things of God. Our text, John 1, 4, it's a vital text because, because John has presented Christ in the context of man's greatest need. And John has done so in, in such a pointed and accurate way a great deal of scripture is devoted to uh, understanding God mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and having a knowledge of the ways of God. And it was, a, it was a grievous to God, you remember, that men didn't understand him and didn't know his ways Amen. and didn't have a heart for him. And this is what the, the basis of, of the purpose of God in, involves. And, and so you see that in the very beginning that words of light and life were used to communicate these things. Even in the earlier days, the prophet would make a connection between life and light. He asked the people, why would you go to the dead to ask about things concerning life, life of the living? And the prophet Isaiah, speaking for God, would tell them, in regards to the law and the testimony, Amen. if they speak not according to that word, it is because there's no light in them. So in the right way, way back then, they started putting these things together. If we are to be in the light, we must have the life of God. In chapter 6, what a tremendous chapter this is. 76 verses long. It's the second longest chapter in the Bible, and for good reason, too. Jesus deals more completely, and he'll deal more extensively with spiritual life, the life that comes from God here. In this account, the multitudes have searched Jesus out again. They've come to him for another miraculous feeding. They say to Jesus, Moses fed our fathers with manna from heaven. And they ask Jesus, what dost thou work? What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? Jesus replied, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven for the Bread of God is which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. And Jesus said unto them, 
And they said unto Jesus, Lord, evermore give us this bread. I'm the bread of life, Jesus said. He that cometh to me shall never, never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am the living bread, he continues to say, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And in verse 36, we have Jesus' assessments of the people's response. It reads like an epithet over the dead. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believeth not. Now, the exhortation of Jesus is to come to him for life. Every man that therefore hath heard and heard, learned of the Father, cometh to me. I want to say that here in John 6, though, that the emphasis of Jesus is not that quickening power of life that comes by the Spirit, but rather uh, Jesus here is as a, as a source of life. In that capacity, he presents himself in that capacity that sustains life, that he gives. It was later after the multitude scattered that Jesus would confirm to his disciples that he was indeed speaking in spiritual words to them. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The multitudes did come to Jesus all right, for they did come. But did they not come? They did not come believing, and they came hungry. You can be sure that the multitudes came hungry, but they did not hunger after the things of God, and the word preached did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. Faith will not. Faith will not allow us to just, just to observe Jesus from a distance, but it will compel us to take a closer look. And to move in. Who, who, whosoever shall take himself to Christ to have life from him will want nothing. But will have in abundance all that contributes to sustain life. When men willingly shut their eyes against the light. And when they turn their eyes from it. Satan darkens their understanding. That's what happened in Revelation. Now. Jesus, because of this circumstance, Jesus was careful to give us plenty of word on this. In the 15th chapter of John, you remember, Jesus speaking not to the multitudes this time, but he's speaking to his own, declares to them, I'm the true vine. I'm the true vine. Everything that's been said in the past about the vine of God, I'm that vine. I'm that vine of God they've been speaking about. Everything that comes to you from God comes by way of your attachment to me. That's what he says. Do take notice that the Lord did not leave with the disciples a long list of things to do and not to do. He tells them one thing. I'm the true vine. Abide in me. I'm the vine. You cannot remain alive if you do not abide in me. You cannot bear fruit if you do not abide in me. Without me, you can do nothing, he says. You cannot bear fruit. If you do not abide in me. And he goes on in these scriptures. To point out the necessity of abiding in him. In this parable we'll see that the father manages our salvation too. Uh It's the father. He's as the gardener of the vine. He tends to every branch. Every one of them. And he prunes them and he dresses them. And he assures that they are bearing fruit unto salvation. And we're exhorted to abide in the vine. Where all the work of the maintenance of the branches are taking place. We're told to abide in him. Now there's a lot of work involved in maintaining our connection to Jesus staying in the vine. There are many things that we have to pay attention to. Because there are so many things that's working against us. Try to cut us away. Try to cut us off with the vine. In your desire for God, do not be distracted from Jesus. The world lies in darkness. Do not be distracted by it. The world will compete for your mind and for your time, which inevitably will disconnect you from Jesus. It will, I promise you that will happen. Do not be distracted from Jesus. The scriptures warn us not to be deceived into taking our attention off of Christ by those who are pretending to be the light. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Uh And for this reason, there are many religious systems having the name of God. Uh 
They offer many kinds of seemingly godly pursuits to involve yourself in their purpose and their projects. But this is a deception. Their purpose is not at all dependent on your connection to Jesus Christ. As the children of light, we should not be in the dark about the deception of the evil one. I want to close with this scripture, and I, I tried to make sure it wasn't somebody's text. <laughs> Colossians 1.12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be, take, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and lights. Yeah. Our inheritance is one of enlightenment, That's right. understanding, insight. We have been illuminated concerning the things of God. If we have new life in Christ, then our essential characteristic is light, you see. We are children of light. We've been called into the kingdom of light. Yeah. We should not be comfortable in an environment that is dull and dark and that lacks insight and understanding. Well, we're not. Your brother and I know you're not. That's why you're here. So... Uh, I, I, I press upon you tonight as I close that our essential element in walking in newness of life is the illumination that Christ gives us. Thank you, brother. Amen.